Botox, fillers, facial aesthetics, etc. My name is Debra Chom, and I will be talking on uh, this particular instruction course as the chief instructor. Along with me are also available Dr. Adit, Dr. Shilpa, and Dr. Kasturi. We'll be connecting Dr. Adit couldn't be here today, so we'll be connecting Dr. Adit's talk first, and that's on Botox. Shilpa was first, but she's stuck in another session. So let's start off with Adit's talk. Hi, can you help me play this? Mithil. So, uh, welcome to our aesthetic sessions. And as in any, hello, ma'am. So, yeah. Thank you for gracing our session, ma'am. So, as in any surgery, uh, when we do, it's very important to know your anatomy first because that will give the most predictable results and you'll be much more confident each and every time when you repeat the procedure. So that's the thing we are going to start with. So as I told why it is important to learn anatomy, I am going to divide my presentation into three parts, the upper face, the mid and lower face and the vasculature of the face. So I'm going to show you three cadaveric dissection videos. The first one is for the upper face. Starting with the first one. So as we uh, know, the most important structure in the upper face is the frontalis muscle. It is the only elevator of the brow. We must remember this. That is the only structure which lifts the brows. There are other muscles like corrugator, procerus, etc., which depress the brow. So uh, it can be a V-shaped fanning muscle or a single structure. When we are injecting neuromuscular junction injections, we must understand this thing. S second important thing, there's a danger zone here because supratrochlear and supraorbital arteries are here. And if we inject fillers into it, the retrograde flow into ophthalmic veins can lead to blockage and even blindness. We must remember that glabular injection of fillers is the most common cause of blindness after filler injections. So <clears throat> next here, around the supraorbital nerves and uh, vessels are the supraorbital uh, nerves. So do not inject directly onto them. They can form neuromas there. When you're inject, uh, injecting anything, fillers of Botox there. When we give Botox for corrugator, that is also the same site here. So that is the important thing uh, next to know in the uh, forehead. This is the corrugator muscle. So procerus is here in the center. This is the thick corrugator muscle. Corrugator muscle is deep initially here near the nose. And as it travels up above the brow, it becomes superficial. So when you inject, you have to inject superficially around the lateral side and medially you inject deep. Ask the patient to frown like this or do something which makes their muscle action prominent and the muscle belly prominent. Hold the belly when you're injecting. Whenever you're injecting fillers, must inject in small bolus, multiple, and massage the uh, fillers so that you accidentally don't inject a lot of filler uh, directly into the vessel. Best is to aspirate. That is the key to it. This is the fusion zone, uh, which is between the temporal area and the frontalis muscle area. Again, here we are seeing the nerves, which are directly going up around the forehead here. And we must not inject here to prevent formation of neuromas, which are very difficult to treat later on. So uh, apart from that, in the upper face, we must know about the temporal area. Temporal area is guided by inferiorly a line joining from the root of helix to the lateral canthal area. And superiorly, it is bounded by the, uh, OK, my mouse is not seen there. So superiorly, it is bounded by the fusion area. Is this a pointer? In the temporal area, most important thing is superficial temporal artery. So it lies one finger breadth above the eyebrow. 
and we must be very cautious when we are injecting around that place. So this is the area for superficial temporal artery and we must be very careful when we are injecting here. So when we are filling the temporal area with fillers, we must be very careful of this thing. Next important thing here is this vein which drains into jugular vein. Again, injection of fillers into it can even lead to uh, serious consequences to life. So, mo and it lies one finger bit above the zygomatic arch. So, when we are doing CK1, CK2 injections at zygomatic arch for fillers, it is important to pay attention to this. That is why most important thing is aspirate before you are injecting. So, this is all about the forehead in the temporal area. Coming to the mid face, in the mid face, important structure to know is the facial artery nerve so we can see facial nerve is here deep down near the ear lobule and as it goes up it becomes superficial this is the orbital branch of the facial nerve which was seen and tagged and next important thing is when we lift the skin in the mid face we have to contour the face and contouring comes from the fat pads the superficial as we can see here this and the deep fat pads so while we are injecting fillers, we must know where are those fat pads. This is the superficial and below this lies the deep fat pads. There are 21 fat pads. The superficial ones are divided into medial malar fat pads. As we can see here, this is the lateral part of the superficial and this is the DMCF, the deep malar fat pad here, this green one. So usually we inject here in uh, male patients and for females we inject laterally to give that curve around the zygomatic arch. So we all know as, an, as ophthalmic surgeons the value of infraorbital nerves and vessels and where they lie. It is important to know these. We must never inject here. Whenever you want to make this area full, never inject directly, medially because of three reasons. First is it will accentuate the nasolabial fold more because if you fill this side more, this will sag and become heavy. Secondly, infraorbital nerves and vessels are here. So we must not inject here. Thirdly, we want to contour the face from the lateral side. So take care of that thing. In the mid and lower phase, the important structures apart from that is the perioral area where there are mimetic muscles of the face. So the zygomaticus major and minor lie below this superficial lateral flare of fat pad, the zygomaticus major and minor muscle which will be seen uh, shortly here. So they lie here and then the depressor anguli oris muscle and the depressor labi inferioris muscle. So this, these are the two zygomaticus major and minor muscles and below here we find the depressor labi, labi and inferioris and depressor anguli oris. So depressor anguli oris is the superior one and depressor labi inferioris is also a fan shape muscle which lies inferior to the DAO which is depressor anguli oris. So whenever we are injecting again the uh, neuromuscular junctions or the fillers over here, especially for NM junctions we need to be uh, injections, we need to be very careful. Also for crow's feet when we are injecting, if we inject into the zygomaticus here, that will lead to improper smile of the patient because it is right now, uh, it is insert, inserted in the perioral area. Again, uh, the last important thing in the mid face is the masseter muscle. This is the strongest muscle in the body as we all know and it is quite deep. It is not very superficial. To check for masseter, ask the patient to clench and then you, you can clench it right, clench it and you can feel the anterior border of the masseter muscle right here. And you can see when we insert the needle into the masseter muscle, it is around 1 to 1.5 centimeters deep. So when you're injecting for bruxism or for giving shape to decrease the volume of the masseter muscle, we have to inject deep. Coming to the last part of the talk, which is the most important part, the vasculature of the face. The most important 
structure here is as we all know the facial vasculature facial artery it starts from the neck one finger breadth ahead of the masseter muscle again if we want to mark it on the face and one thumb width away from the angle of the mouth so that is the place where it is running actually the surface anatomy of it it is deep initially and as it goes up it has a tortuous course on the face and it becomes superficial especially around the ala of the nose so when we are injecting fillers around the ala of the nose this area we have to be really careful again aspirate to check whether you are into the into that or not it gives branches as superior and inferior labial artery and they are superficial they are at the junction of dry and wet vermilion on the lips and uh, inferior in the inferior lip it lies uh, even starts deep to the dli but then becomes superficial here also it is superficial whenever we are doing lip injections they have to be superficial right. and not deeper than 3 mm actually as it runs up we all know the angular vessels are the branches of this artery and again it is a danger zone we must not inject here it gives further dorsal nasal artery and columnar branches here these vessels actually are draining the veins are draining into cavernous sinus and can lead to serious consequences so again the checkpoint is aspirate before you inject and every time at least nothing serious will happen so apart from this vasculature the nose is a very vascular area so when we are injecting into nose we have to remember that there is a smas layer we must inject below the smas layer and not above that because it's a vascular area and can uh, lead to dreaded complications so uh, thank you all of you thank you for your kind attention i hope i made myself clear mam you go ahead you go ahead next okay bye it's my pleasure to welcome dr kasturi and she'll be speaking on fillers and how fillers are meant to be injected uh, we've been conducting this course for the last 5 years so if there's any uh, questions we are happy to take those please uh thank you dr dirbraj for having me in this session this session i mean this ic has been running for almost 3 to 4, 4 years i think Five years, and it's always a delight to be in this course. You learn so much about the aesthetics, and I'm yeah about the facial aesthetics. So after the wonderful talk by Dr. Shilpa is coming, I'll be speaking on the aesthetic applications of the dermal fillers. No financial interest in any product of the uh, presentation. We all know that facial aging is often associated with loss of some tissue, and secondly, we also see hypertrophy of the tissue. The loss we basically see in the malar region when we look to the periocular region, and hypertrophy is basically the orbital fat that we see the prolapse of the orbital fat, and because of this loss and hypertrophy. there are different classification uh, regarding the different types of presentation in the periocular region where the most simple one we call the type 1 is a hill where you have the fat type 2 is a valley the trough so there is a different calculus uh, i mean classification that has come out and this is what we follow the base on the atrophy changes that we see in the periorbital region or the bulging changes or the laxity So one of the most common indication for dermal filler for the ophthalmologist is the tear trough and when we call it tear trough it is basically a separation of the palpebral part of the orbicularis muscle from the orbital part of the orbicularis muscle so this is actually the tear trough but many a times i see the people they i mean uh, uh, they think that this nas nasojugal fold that you can see in green many of them they think that this is the tear trough so this is not the correct tear trough this is basically when this muscle splits up and we get a deepening and this is what we call the tear trough so you should know what is a prominent tear trough and i feel that there are multiple factors which account for the changes one being the depth of the trough the second being the hyper or the dispigmentation and because of this it gives a illusion of depth and the third being the prolapse of the nasal fat especially in situation where you see the nasal fat 
when they might come much anterior or posterior to the plane of the lacrimal crest and the most important thing that other uh, i mean is the changes that we see around the eye are the rhytidosis so we need to manage the wrinkles we need to manage the trough we need to manage the hills so considering all the three important components we feel that this is not only changes in the skin but also it uh, occurs in the changes in the bone and because of this soft tissue and the bony changes we see the conversion of this positive vector that we have to the face where the malar eminence lies much anterior to the plane of the corneal plane and this gets converted into negative vector because of the detrusion or resorption of the bone and this is what we call a negative vector so the whole positivity the young look changes into a little elderly look because of the differential uneven and site specific bone changes that we see where the pyramid becomes more of a squarish as we age and also the topographic changes and this leads to multiple periocular changes which can be in the form of the ibex it can be in the form of the malar mounds and the festoon it can be in the form of a double convex deformity that is you have both the mounds and the bags it can be in the form of the horizontal laxity it can be in the form of the dermatogalasis or it can be in the form of the tear trough and other wrinkle i mean periocular changes so what balances this hypotrophy and hypertrophy it is the dermal filler and there are different types of dermal filler as i have already mentioned the most common indication is the or the tear trough and the hills and the valley so as i have already shown you the classification one is hill valley hill valley hill valley hill valley okay so when you have a early hill like this you need not go for a surgery you can very well manage with the dermal filler so i'll be sharing you some of the patients out here but if you have a very prominence of the orbital fat yeah when you have a very big orbital fat and this plane is much anterior like it's so prominent that is anterior to the plane of the anterior lac lacrimal crest so this are the situation where the filler will not work you need to go for the surgery so there are different techniques and different injection patterns but what we follow is basically the retrograde injection so that we don't do any vascular complication we follow the fanning pattern and we follow the greek pattern so i'll just go fast into some of the patients and you can go by the injection you can go by the cannula and the best way i feel is to go by the cannula and when we all started we started injection and this is also a very nice way where directly you can inject the my min i mean small elicots of this dermal filler into the tear trough and you see changes on the table you can see the right side i am injecting as i am injecting along the periorbital rim in the region of the uh, tear trough which we say the classical three points tt1 tt2 tt3 and you see this concealing of the fat look to the left the lift you can still see the trough you can see the fat but on the, the right side it is vanished so you can see the results on the table and also it can be done not only with this uh, injection needle it can also be done with a cannula so this is one of the patient who comes to me you can see she's a young lady with very prominent fat so in her case you can use a cannula advantage of a cannula is that you do not get the brew you do not get any those small small vascular i mean changes that we see and you can very nice have a very good effacement of the late cheek junction as you can see here and this is she can look at her fat that is before the injection and after the injection this concealing of the fat and also much improvement of the tear trough so there are different ways of doing sometimes i do with cannula sometimes with needle and a combination of both cannula and needle especially when you do laterally i feel a little injection with the needle gives a much better correction and this are some of the patient where you can see the change from a negative vector uh, to a positive vector can you see this how it has changes from a negative to a positive vector and it gives a very good correction of concealing the fat along with the correction of the tear trough and i want to mention that results are just immediate if you really look to his see this is the injection this is the only one point entry of the cannula and look at the change the i mean the bags out here you almost see that it has gone off so there are different ways and there are different indication one of the common indication when initial we started doing blepharoplasty and we used to remove lots of the fat what we used to see we used to see the periocular pigmentation we used to see loss of prominence of the tear trough can you see this it has become so prominent so those uh, post blepharoplasty augmentation with dermal filler it really works good as you can see here it gives a good correction it fills up the i mean the area and you can get the results immediately i think i have got just minutes or second
that is so i'm just going faster this is before and after the surgical procedure and these are some of the patient who had gone for early blepharoplasty they're very happy in the initial five years but after five years you see look at the skin it looks so much wrinkled up you can see so much of i mean the prominence of the tear trap so these patients really work good when you do a augmentation with filler post surgery and the results are really very good and you can fill up the tears and also you can conceal the fat so these are some of the patient that i like to share and along with the other indication besides the periocular region this is also under the patient where you inject the filler this is with the cannula you can do a very good injection very good effacement of the lead cheek junction and this is a beautiful product sometimes in crossfit like there are patients with static lines who do not work well or even with uh, injection botulinum toxin so along with the Uh, toxin if you can do little bit of myomodulation by minute. injecting the dermal filler you can you can really do very well we use this for a facelift but facelift i just want to show this animation this is a most important point where you inject on the zygoma because this is the most important point which many of the plastic surgeon calls is the g point so if you give a first i mean injection there there are different ways either you give a single bolus or three um, alicates you can find that it not only lifts the face it opens up the eye and also gives some amount of the eyebrow lift so there are different different points to it where you can really overlies the face you can slim the face as you can see this lady she looks much better after the third injection before and after the procedure so there are different indications and another indication which has become a very common for all of us the nasal label fold and the lips it lips it really gives a very good fill up as you can see here this is a short video I'll finish it in one minute. This is a short video of the whole face filler, where you can see the classical point in the zygoma. I'm giving, I'm giving in the mid face re region. Then I'll give in the pre auricular region in order to lift the face further. This we call, uh, this a different ways. You can just call it a pre auricular region, or you can call the CK four point, whichever it is convenient. Not going much into details. It's a very big topic. And so then after doing this uh, mid face, you can also go for the chin augmentation. We have got much better product now. for the chin augmentation then also you can also uh, make the chin uh, much i mean elongated and also smoothen out and then you can also go for the correction of the lips so there are different ways but many a times you can see the lips it really make a change this i'll i'll be showing it this is before during the procedure where you can do with a needle you can do with a cannula and i usually prefer using the cannula i feel that why the advantage of using a cannula is that it doesn't give any of the bruise and also any of the vascular complication is much less and you get a much correction beautiful correction of the lips it need not give too much of volume what we want we just need a smoothening of the lip like it it should look a fresh uh, looking lip so then i'll just end it here and not show any other video so also it can be used for scar revision and yesterday i was talking on multiple functional indication it is used for a uh, rhinoplasty which is known as a liquid implant for the rhinoplasty where especially in those type of broken nose you can just correct the deformity and it really gives a beautiful correction and these are some of the indication the facial indication thank you very much for the patient hearing and thank you debraj for having me in this course wonderful talk as always madam i'm sorry i'm rushing through the slides because i'm doing the se rashmi session yes congratulations once again i have to judge now. sure see you bye can i have the laptop any questions anyone you've heard wo oh, laptop de dijiye any questions anyone uh, you've heard two talks now you've heard a little bit about how anatomy is to be assessed and what happens with fillers etc uh, any any questions that you have any questions that we can take so i uh, uh, i will be presenting on combination therapy इसका चार्जर लगाइए फॉर दोज हू डोंट नो मी माई नेम इज देवराज शो एंड वी रन अ चेन ऑफ क्लिनिक्स कॉल दी एस्थेरिक क्लिनिक्स एंड इट्स माई प्लेजर एज द चीफ इंस्ट्रक्टर ऑफ दिस कोर्स टू टेक यू थ्रू कॉम्बिनेशन रिजुबिनेशन विच वी परफॉर्म फॉर एजिंग फेसेज 
Certain financial disclosures are in place. I'm a faculty at Allergan for the past 15 years, at MERS for the past 15 years, and also a faculty with Aptos, which produces the threads which are used in this particular presentation. Now we all understand that the OG curve is something which denotes youth. When you look at a youthful face, especially at 45 degrees, you're able to see a S-shaped curve of the face. This is what is an OG curve. However, aging destroys the OG curve. So essentially what is aging? This slide actually is possibly the fulcrum on which the entire presentation is based. If you understand this, you will understand everything post this. Essentially, aging is mother gravity being ever so kind and mother gravity pulling all of us downwards and medially. And as our facial tissues slide downwards and medially, we get the tear troughs which develop under the eye and we also get the nasolabial folds which develop. Why is this important to know? Because some people tend to mistakenly believe that fillers are something which is like tar, it's like coal tar. Wherever you see a depression, go and fill it up. Like you see a pothole on a road, you put coal tar, similarly you put it in. But that's not true. Why is it not true? Because remember that this, this uh, tear trough deformity developed because everything sagged down. And unless and until you can lift everything up, you'll never get the tear trough deformity working well. Now, there are also certain changes which occur as we age. As men go into their fourth and fifth decades, the testosterone levels, which is the main male hormone, tends to go down. Ditto for women as they approach menopause. What happens is essentially the fat starts to get redistributed in the face. Initially, the superficial fat is more. That tends to start to disappear as you age. Initially, also in youth, the deeper fat is less. That tends to increase as you age. So essentially, what is aging? Aging is a grape losing all its volume and becoming a raisin. So if you think of that analogy, you will understand that volumization is something that becomes critically important in making faces look younger. There are also changes which occur in the bone. And what is happening is your bone is undergoing resorption all the time. Think of your facial soft tissues as if they are a bed sheet on your bed. So what is happening as you age is the bed is becoming smaller and as we are gaining weight, most of us are gaining weight and becoming heavier as we become older, the bed sheet is becoming too much. So as a result of which you have too much bed sheet and too little bed and that's also the problem. So think of fillers as a way of augmenting the bony skeleton. Think of fillers as a way of contouring the face. Do not think of fillers as going ahead and just filling up depressions like you fill up potholes with coal tar. And that's the reason you find so many people looking funny on television. Fillers don't make people look funny. It's doctors who don't know how to use fillers who make people look funny. Now, this was the first aging paper which come out, came out of the aesthetic clinics. In fact, it's the first aging paper which came out of India. Until this paper was published in 2018 in Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery, which is basically the flagship journal of the American Society of Plastic Surgeons. Until then, we did not have any data on how Indians really age. If you don't know how Indians age, how will you treat them? But that was what exactly what was happening. We were treating Indians and their aging based on what Caucasian instructors were teaching us. And we were obviously going wrong with that. Now look at, see, essentially, whether you do phaco surgery, you do refractive surgery, disease recognition as a doctor is ultimately pattern recognition. Aging is also about pattern recognition. Try and see if you identify some patterns on these faces. What happens to this face at age 23? What happens to this face at age 37 in this serial photographic uh, uh, study which was performed at age 71 and at age 76, right? Let's do the same here at 20 through 45 and then going on to 51. See how the lower face is looking older and older. Look at how the cervical mental angle or the angle of the neck is becoming more and more obtuse. Look at how certain things are changing even in men, especially with men losing hair, how the upper part of the face is aging. This gives us some sort of an understanding. The first thing which we understand is in Indians, because of the melanin in our skin, the upper third of the face ages reasonably well. And if the upper third of your face ages reasonably well and botulinum toxin is something which is performed in the upper third of the face, India is not Botox country. 
so people tend to mistakenly believe that facial aesthetics i know how to inject botox sorry that's not even 10% of facial aesthetics the mid face and the lower face are the real problem areas it is the neck the loss of definition in the jaw line the uh, lower face which really becomes a problem area like i said it's the bed sheet becoming too much and the bed reducing in size so let's look at some patients right i mean because we have limited time this is really a 45 minute talk which we need to condense into 25 so let's look at some of these things now this particular lady came into us and i uh, appreciated if pictures were not taken of patients thanks so uh, uh, we have these uh, this lady who came in and this lady wanted to go ahead and get her right and left sides of the face treated you may note very clearly that the right and the left eyes don't look the same there is a inferior scleral show on the right side which is not there on the left side the right eyebrow is also higher when she smiles this becomes even more accentuated and the left eye becomes smaller she had been to repeat numerous plastic and oculoplastic surgeons who had suggested a ptosis surgery of the left eye but my question to you is if at all the palpebral fissure is different by 0.5 mm are we good enough surgeons to correct palpebral fissure heights of 0.5 mm differences and are we good enough to correct it with predictability in all our patients if the answer is no and i am not that good a surgeon so if the answer is no then the answer would be to treat it predictably with toxin and fillers so we did a couple of units of botulinum toxin out here which is used to flatten the hypertrophic orbicularis oculi roll the roll which when you smile causes the eye to become smaller and then we did a little bit of filler out here and that's how the patient looks immediately after so you took her from here to there where now she's smiling everything else remains the same but the under eye and the eyes look much more symmetrical and look transformed the fillers are going to last approximately 2 years or so the botulinum toxin will last only 3 months that's true but then the botulinum toxin also is only 2 units it's going to cost us 700 rupees as opposed to a ptosis surgery which might have been much more risky as well as difficult to perform let's look at another patient a 46 year old patient madam if you would not uh, uh, record the uh, patient this things because of patient privacy thanks in advance 46 year old lady and when we look at faces we should also try and understand what's happening to their brains she came into us she wasn't interested in looking younger she was interested she wanted to know if she could look more energetic she wanted to know uh, she said i am at the pinnacle of my career i am a ceo in a top company i want to look younger i i want to look more rested i want to look more rejuvenated and i definitely don't want to look tired people think i look tired when she smiles you can see why she's looking tired and this is a patient who's been on follow up with us for the past 15 years almost at that time when we started off our treatment we had only one filler in india which is the juvederm ultra plus which was a very substandard filler but even with those substandard fillers and botulinum toxins you can create miracles you can create patients who look like this so if you can create this sort of difference without performing surgery why then do you need to perform surgery especially if it's only a 30 minute procedure you will also get patients like this who have a nasolabial fold and who have a very light fold now in a caucasian patient who have a very light fold this is very easy to treat this could be done by anyone and you could basically go ahead and use a little bit of filler and remove this particular fold because the fillers are made up of hyaluronic acid which have a high osmotic gradient these fillers will also absorb water from the surrounding tissue over the next couple of weeks and this fold will disappear completely but some of these folds may not be light folds now this is there is this this patient here who's come from bahrain and she has a very heavy fold if you think of the earlier patient the earlier patient had just a valley this patient not only has a valley but also has a mountain above the valley in this patient merely filling the valley is not going to lead to her looking younger if you remember my first slide the reason she has a valley she has a mountain is because all the fat pads from the lateral part are coming down so essentially you need to take the mountain up to where it used to be which is upwards and laterally on the face that's what we do using fillers in this particular case and we are using a high g prime filler where we inject on the zygomatic bone like dr kasturi showed and we raise the face in this 
particular manner essentially think of the face like a tent the cloth of the tent has become loose so you're raising the prongs of the tent so that the skin can become tighter that's essentially what you're doing and once the mountain has moved up then you can use a lower g prime filler to uh, uh, sort of put it on the valley and that's the sort of results that you can create What's a facial thread lift? A facial thread is an outstation procedure which is done in the doctor's cabin. It's done in the doctor's office. This does not require any general or local anesthesia. Only topical anesthesia which is prilocaine gel can be used. And what we do essentially in this is we put in a thread. What's a thread? A thread is like the stem of a rose and this thread actually has thorns all the way around. This engages the skin from the inside and lifts up the face. Let's see a video of how that happens this is an outstation procedure the results will last approximately two years or so and it's a very very simple procedure indeed that's the thread which is being inserted with the cannula patient is awake little bit of bleeding and you will cut these uh, threads or the edges of those right next to the skin these remain buried. These are absorbable threads. They will disappear in due course. But while they are there, they will produce collagen and cause the face to look tighter. This works really well in this sort of a heavy face. Again, you have a mountain above and a valley below. And what you will do is you will use threads in order to tighten the face. And then this can be used to completely change the way the person looks. Certain people also come in as, as we age because of the facial tissues coming down. Essentially what is happening is that our face starts to look tired and starts to look a little bit angry as well. Using fillers and threads in these patients can give a much more pleasant look, can make people look happier, can make people look a little bit more relaxed. Not everything can be performed with non-surgically and that's why all of us train to be surgeons and we perform the mid-face lift very commonly through the intraoral route. So in patients who have a mid-face uh, uh, depression, what we essentially do is we go through the superior gingival sulcus and we raise up the facial tissues so the incisions are hidden inside the mouth and then we also have an incision behind the hairline so you're taking two zero proline sutures through the uh, malar fat pad which is then tunneled above and tied onto the deep temporal fascia so all the incisions are hidden and the moment you do that you can see the left side appears higher than the right side already and the reason for the left side appearing higher than the right side is because you've gone ahead and repositioned the fat back to where it came from and that's the sort of pull effect you can create you can see how the pull is created the results will last for five years easily in this short 45 minute procedure some more patients this was a 68 year old grandmom who came in from the u.s and she wanted to look much more uh, relaxed, rejuvenated, and her grandson wanted her to do something so that she looked younger. So she came in on her birthday, and she wanted to look younger, and you can see that there's significant dermatochelasis. We performed a mid-face lift, upper and lower eyelid blepharoplasty and carbon dioxide laser, and that's what she looks approximately six weeks post the procedure. That's another patient, again, a 70-year-old who obviously was having vision restriction also because of the amount of dermatochelasis. In him as well, we've performed a mid-face lift, a blepharoplasty and carbon dioxide laser resurfacing. That's another common procedure that we perform. When you have a double chin, etc., since all the fat is coming down, you can actually remove the fat from the neck and reposition it back to where it came from, which is from the upper face. And essentially, the moment you do that, you can actually transform the faces in this manner. It's just look at how the shape of the face makes such a big impact on the way a person looks. On the left-hand side, she probably ends up looking much higher, much more heavier. She's not lost a single pound of uh, uh, weight, but the face looks much more elegant here. This is a 52-year-old patient in whom all of these procedures which were discussed have been performed and that's how she looks approximately about six weeks later. Many people think that this is the daughter of the same lady. It's not. It's the lady herself.
There are also some other things that are being developed now. Earlier, when we used to have squarish jawlines or very broad faces, we used to actually have to perform mandibular uh, angle surgery where we used to shave off the angle and remove a part of the masseter muscle because when your face is so squarish, there can be multiple problems. A, you can have bruxism, so you can actually wear your enamel down by the teeth grinding all the time because of the strength of this muscle. B, because the face looks so squarish, you can end up looking looking a slightly less aesthetic than you would want. And what we started doing is we started using botulinum toxin. Not that we started it, there were others doing it as well, but we actually wrote a paper which showcased how much botulinum toxin needs to be injected, how many sessions need to be performed, and how many times when you perform it, the results last longer. So we actually published this paper and you will see the difference that is created in some of these patients. Again, she's not lost a pound of weight but her face looks much slimmer because you've been able to reduce the masseter hypertrophy using the botulinum toxin. And that's serial pictures showing how the entire thing has developed over a period of time. Some more patients. This, of course, has been published in, a, in plastic and reconstructive surgery. We now perform 60 units of the Botox on either side of the face. And once this is done four times, the results are almost semi-permanent, last for approximately four years. What could be better? Dr. Kasturi did speak about some rhinoplasty cases. We perform surgical rhinoplasty also in our practices. But the non-surgical rhinoplasty is a nice thing to do. And this is how it's done. This is how the filler is actually inserted using a cannula just below the nasal mass. And this is another part of doing it. This is below the lower lateral cartilages in, uh, above the nasal dorsum that this is being done. And these are some of the results that you'll create. Look at the right light reflex. Look at the right reflex right in the center of the nose. And the moment the nose starts looking better, this should interest all the ophthalmologists in the room, the eyes start become to be uh, become better seen. You start noticing the eyes when there are no other facial abnormalities. So beautiful eyes, that's what you'll realize in those photographs because the nose now is reflecting light right in a central line. And you can see how the nasal, uh, the nostrils have started to become uh, different. We can also do f uh, threads for these. And when you put threads into the nose, you can actually lift the nose up. Again, I don't think I have time to show you procedure videos. You've already seen what threads look like. But those are the sort of results that can be created and the nose changed non-surgically. You can see how it's become much more conical from the base and how the nostrils have become much more apical as opposed to the earlier patient. Nasal humps can also be removed using fillers and that's the before and the after and you can see how he used to have a nasal hump out here where filler has been put in. And then some of us get a depressed tip when we are smiling. You can see that when she's smiling, she's actually got a depressed tip. Fillers and threads can actually change that. Those are almost surgical-like results from that perspective and you can see how the nose appears to be far better now and better supported as well. So all in all, uh, that's what I have today. Uh, again, astonishing picture perhaps, non-surgical rhinoplasty. This is not surgery. Many people uh, uh, do think that it's surgery. So all in all, this is what we do for a living. Uh, these are some of the papers which have come out of the aesthetic clinics over the past couple of years, three years to be precise. And moving science forwards is what we are trying to do in aesthetics. If there are any further questions, I don't think I have time for all of this, but uh, if there are any further questions, happy to take those. Or otherwise, if you feel that you need to learn some of these, write in on an email to us, happy to teach whatever we know. Thank you once again for your kind attention and a patient hearing. Happy to take questions for five minutes. Uh, carbon dioxide laser, ma'am, we don't use it for pigmentation. Carbon dioxide laser, we... Yeah, the scars, we would go till the basement membrane, ma'am. You can go till the basement membrane and you can treat it and you'll get very good results. Uh, the laser itself won't cross the basement membrane, which means that it'll go between the epidermis and the dermis. But the good part is that it'll cause collagen formation, which can make even deeper scars appear lighter. Hello. Hello. 
um, I am told by the plastic surgeons that uh, fillers will last not last for long and it will go off in a one or two years time uh, but if you want you can uh, the fat from your abdomen around the umbilicus can be transplanted to your face and that will last 50% uh, will of it will go off in a period of time of say two to three years and then if you want you can repeat it so what are, what do you think about the uh, uh, risks of uh, fat transposition from another part of your body, especially if you think about uh, pulmonary embolism. We've done, uh, uh, we are into our 15th year of practice. The aesthetic clinics were set up 15 years ago. And in our 15th year of practice, we've now had the ability or we've had the chance to see some of our patients with long-term follow-ups. Almost all of our fat patients have done badly. And it is not because of our technique. Whatever technique you use, fat is extremely unpredictable. Fat can disappear very quickly. No plastic surgeon, doesn't matter what background they come from, will ever be able to guarantee how long the fat is going to last. Second, fat is living tissue. And because fat is living tissue, the cells are living. If someday you were to put on weight, the fat cells here can form lumps. We've seen that. Granulomas are very common with fat transfers. So therefore, on the face, at least the top institutes on the planet have decided to use long-term fillers itself. And now, even with the hyaluronic acid fillers, you get results which last two years very predictably. There are longer-term fillers which are available, semi-permanent fillers which are available in the US, etc., which makes fillers last five years. Fat, you can't even guarantee six months. So why would we use that? This with regards to your second question, with regards to pulmonary embolism vascular problems are a problem with any sort of a medical device whether you're using fat which takes up space or using a filler which is an injectable medical device you could have complications with either there are 200 plus cases of blindness which have been noted with fat and filler both all across the planet but when you consider that about 300 million procedures get done every year 200 cases of blindness over the past 20 years is a drop in the ocean. So as long as we are careful, I don't think there is much to worry with fat or with filler. But because of the reasons that I have specified, we prefer filler to fat and we don't prefer uh, fat in our practices. Is the, 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 the skin improve with uh, fat under the skin? Yes and no. F skin actually improves even with fillers under the skin. When you have fillers under the skin, that also improves the texture, the turgor of skin, uh, of uh, the, the way the face looks. The challenge, hi sir, the challenge is that fat has a lot of other problems. There are also people who don't inject the fat but take fibrin and actually inject platelet-rich fibrin or PRP in under this thing. No evidence whatsoever that it works right it is just someone saying that it worked in their patients but if it works so beautifully in their patients we would love to see some strong randomized controlled trials which prove the same thank you